Let's pray before we begin. Lord, please let us understand your word and put it in our hearts. May it shape our lives to be more like your Son. In Jesus' name we ask, Amen. Or on the west side of Chicago, or on the north side, or in certain parts of East Chicago, Hammond, Whiting, I wish you could see the thousands of little boys and girls in this great Chicagoland area whom no one seems to love. I mean, no one. It makes you wonder, really, what's going to happen to this nation in the next generation. It also makes you wonder if a kid has a chance. Like these boys that are just about to sit up straight here on the front. That's right. Like this fellow here is going to sit up straight. That's right. Stand up, son. I, I'm, not, I'm not mad at you. I want you to stand up. I want to just use you for a minute. Take a kid like that. Come here. Come up here a minute. I'm not mad at you. I'm going to be good to you for a change. Turn around and face the people. Now, that's what you call a typical American kid. He's been to Texas. How many times have you been to Texas? Well, you've got Texas freckles all over your face. You've bound to have been there some. Thank you, pal. Has he got a chance? Does he have a chance? How old are you, son? Twelve. <coughs> Does he have a chance? Already. Already, folks are trying to probably set him dope. Anybody ever tried to get you to take dope yet? Not yet. Praise the Lord. Just around the corner, Satan's going to point the needle toward him and say, You want to really have fun? You want to really go on a trip? By the way, Satan hasn't gotten it. Uh, the narcotics or the devil has no trips to compare with the trip we've been on this week. None at all. None at all. But it won't be long now till the devil's going to point the needle at him. But that isn't it. Oh, the dirty liquor traffic is going to try to get him. Satan's going to put newspaper ads and television commercials before that kid. And do everything he can to get him. Because the devil wants him. The devil's going to try to spend every weapon, use every weapon he can to get him. Little lady, you'll have to be seated in church here. You'll have to be seated. You'll have to be seated. You'll have to be seated in church. That's right. You can't just walk around in church. You can't uh, walk. You should be seated now. I'm preaching right now. You'll have to be seated, and I'll be glad to see you after the service is over. And uh, anything, anybody want to get up and whistle? And uh, anything you want to do, just do it. I mean, but uh, that's all right. I'll be glad to see you after the service. But right now we're preaching, and nothing stops the preaching. <laughs> it reminds me of a, of a we had we had a lady in our church. And this is a very sane, sensible lady. We had a lady in our church that sort of, you know, like some of these fellows on the platform, and, and uh, she came down to the front while I was preaching one day, and Brother Lyons over the other building came, looked down and said, "What is it you want, Gertrude?" And she said, "I want to play Home Sweet Home on my French harp." But <laughs> next Sunday she came down and said she'd move, want her address changed on the church record. And so anything you want to do here, feel free to do it. But uh, the honest, simple truth is, the devil's after that kid. He's after him. I mean, the dope crowd and the liquor traffic and the licentious, lewd, the homosexual crowd, the adulterous crowd, the devil is after that kid. Has he got a chance? Does he have a chance to turn out decent and right? Yes, he does. But there's only one. Only one. He must be planted in the house of God. Now, the psalmist here talks about being, he says, um, uh, they, those that are planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now, this is a, a psalm that was sung on the Sabbath. It was a psalm uh, uniquely dedicated to the Sabbath day. It was the kind of a song that we'd sing. We'd come to church and we'd sing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It was uniquely suited to the worship on the Sabbath day. Now, a tree planted in a house. Why would they talk about a tree being planted in a house, young people? Why? 
because the houses, many of you folks, anybody here ever grew up in the country where, uh, where you had a, a big hallway down the middle and, and it, was, it was open on either end? Remember, you had a hallway down, and you usually had a well right in the middle of the hall, uh, old, the old pumping kind. Anybody here, a poor, ignorant, dumb, hillbilly that's 100 years old? Anybody like that? I am. Anybody? Well, numbers of you. You used to have houses where you'd walk down the middle of the hall on either side would be the rooms, and uh, wouldn't be any door to the back. You'd just walk out in the back, and usually on a back porch or somewhere would be a, a well. Well, now, the houses were built in, in the Oriental days uh, four square. You'd have um, uh, houses built sort of like this, and in the middle of the house, it was open to the sky. Now, what they would do, they would take a tree and plant that tree in the middle of that open spot that was open to the sky. They'd always take a small tree, not a big tree, because a big tree was harder to transplant. You couldn't get the big tree to, to grow as it readily, but they'd take a small tree, a little sprout, if you please, and put that small tree in the middle of the house. Now, they'd take all the rocky, usually in the, uh, in the land of Palestine, they, it's, it's very rocky there, they'd take all the rocky soil out. They'd go out and get some more soil and bring that soil inside the house, in that little open space, open to the sky, and they would put this little tree in the center. Now, what they'd do is this. They would protect that tree from the winds, the howling winds, because the house was on all sides. Also, they, they, the house, the warmth of the house, would provide warmth in cold weather for the tree. It was, would, would thereby be always near the owner. The owner would always have the, house, the tree right to him, and right close to him where he could see it every day. And they'd keep the weeds away. Every morning, the owner of these houses would come out and check and see if the tree was all right. If there were weeds there, he'd chop the weeds. And if the soil was not good enough, he'd bring the soil in. It was an everyday process. The owner would always nurture and care for the tree, not just on the Sabbath, but every day. Every day, it was planted in the house. Every fault was corrected immediately. Now, the, the idea was, if the tree were cared for in this way, it would bear fruit longer and be much more productive while it was bearing fruit. Now, is the Lord talking here about a tree, a real tree? No. He is using a figure of speech. He's taking this little tree that was planted by an owner of a house when he built a house around, four square, around a little patio kind of a thing, open to the sky. He was taking this little tree, so carefully placed and so carefully planted and so carefully nourished and nurtured, and likening this tree to a human being. He's saying, you take a, a child, when he's young, plant him in the house of God. Warm him, protect him from the howling winds of temptation and adversity. Bring in the very best soil, the best environment you can for that child. Watch him, not once a week, but every day, and I say what I've said before, 30 minutes a week is not enough Bible teaching for the average person for a child to grow up and mount to something for God. You can't take a child and put him in the hands of the heathen for 40 hours a week and put him in the hands of a Sunday school teacher 30 minutes a week and guarantee it that he'll turn out okay. But every day, every day, that child, nurtured, guarded, carefully protected, environment the very best, uh, weeds chopped out, winds kept from him, warp put to him all the time. And the Lord says, in old age, he will still bring forth fruit. Now, say what you want to say. You can say what you want to say, but the honest, simple truth is, the best way in this world to rear our children is God's way. And God says, plant him in the house of God. I have said this before and I say it again. Young people at First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, you don't need to go outside this church for anything you need in your life. There's no need you have that this church can't satisfy. I'm talking about except your family, of course. You don't have to go out in the world to have your fun. We have more fun right here than the world has. Listen, if Hollywood, if Hollywood could buy what went on Tuesday night at that civic center, they'd pay any price for it. I mean, listen, brother, Max Helton can outdo Red Skelton any day. <laughs> Jim Vineyard's a bigger monkey than they, if they've got, they've got in Hollywood. And Earl Dukes is a bigger monkey than Helton or Vineyard either one. <laughs> now I'm simply saying this. Look, look. This world 
has pointed every gun in its arsenal toward this boy right here and toward your kids and toward mine. Now, we're going to have to undergird our forces and we're going to have to heed the Word of God that says, if they be planted in the house of God when they're old, they'll bring forth fruit. Now, I want you to notice what they did. In the first place, they put them there early. They put them there early. I was in a barber shop the other day, not far from here, and the fellow was getting a haircut, and I was waiting. And uh, this fellow, and I started talking. I was reading the sport page, and I said to the barber, what kind of chance do you think the Cubs have this year? The Cubs won a ball, a pennant, last time our church softball team won a game. And I said, what kind of chance do you think the Cubs have this year? And the fellow in, in the barber chair, who was a Cub fan, he, we started talking, and very nice, friendly kind of guy. And so the, the, the thing, the subject uh, was, was directed toward children. Well, I don't know. And toward the temptation of the day. And I said something. I didn't know who the fellow was, and he didn't know who I was, I guess. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But um, anyway, uh, he, he said, well, I just don't think you can shelter children. I just think if you, if, you, if, you, if you shelter them too much when they get old, they won't amount to anything. You've got to let them when they're young see life as it really is. And uh, the barber said, what do you think about that, Reverend? And I said, I think it's a beautiful day. And uh, he said, this fellow said, well, I just think you, ought to, you can shelter them too much. I just think kids ought to be out and see some of the world so when they get older, they, they won't be shocked and they won't get tripped up. And the barber said, what do you think about that, Reverend? And I said, I think the Cubs are going to win the pennant this year. And, amen. And uh, so uh, glad we finally got down to your spiritual temperature. But... Uh, uh, I didn't think the Cubs win the pennant this year. And it, I, I refused to answer the question. And so when the fellow walked out and I got in the chair, I asked the barber who he was. Who's this fellow that says you, you can shelter him too much? He said he runs a tavern over here on State Street. That's the kind of crowd that talks like you talk. That's the kind of crowd that uses your language. I'd be ashamed to have the same argument the tavern keeper has. He runs a place over here on the corner of State and Soul. This nice little leap in and lip out place. I'm simply saying, you can say it all you want to say it. I can prove. I can prove. You plant a child in the house of God. You nurture that child. You teach the Bible not one day a week, but every day a week. And you nurture him and care for him and keep the howling winds of temptation away from him. And feed this blessed old book to him and train him all the time. He'll turn out ten to one better than the kid that's left out in the world run, wrote by himself. He will. I can prove it. I walked, I walked over last night to the preacher boys on my, whose pictures are on my wall. And I went through them one at a time. One at a time. And of the men, young men from our church who are pastoring churches now, 32 of them out pastoring churches now. I have 90 preacher boys, but 32 of our boys are pastoring or in full-time work for God now. 32 of them. Now get this. 28 of them grew up in this church and built their lives around the church. Only four were transplanted. I challenge you. I challenge you in front of this whole church to prove your point, that, you can, that, that a kid won't grow up to be better and you won't rear really better kids if they're planted in God's house all the time. I challenge you to stand behind this pulpit some Sunday and prove your point. I get a little weary of people saying, well, I just don't see eye to eye. I dare you to prove it. Now, now either put up or shut up. I mean, either, either say, okay, preacher, I'll challenge you. And we'll find the kids that were, grew up in this church and went to youth activities and went to soul winning and built their lives around the church and they lived here and they grew up here. This was their second home. I challenge you to prove me that they don't grow up in greater percentages to amount to something decent, church-going, tithing, soul-winning, uh, honorable, clean-living citizens. I challenge you. Lady, you'll have to be seated now in this church. Lady, you'll have to be seated during this service. You'll have to be seated. You have no other choice. We just don't get up and walk around this church. You'll have to be seated while you're here. Now, I'm simply saying, if you want your children to grow up to be decent, law-abiding, Christians, church-going, Sunday school teaching, deacons, and soul winners, and fruitful adults. 
you're going to have to come back to the simple truth that this old sin-cursed, wicked world is after your kid, and you're going to have to plant it. You say, I just don't see eye to eye. You just wait till your kids grow up. You just wait. You're risking the future of your children on your stubbornness. Just because you don't want to agree with the preacher, you are risking the entire future of your kids, the most precious possession you have in this world. In God's name, listen to God when He says, They that be planted in the house of the Lord shall be fruitful in their old age. And so they put them there early. You can't transplant a tree as easily as you can, as you can plant a young sprout. And so they took this small sprout, and then they checked them daily. Every morning when the man in the Oriental house would get up, he'd come to the little tree and he'd look at it carefully, look at it carefully. He'd go out and gather some soil from the outside and put good soil. He'd take the rocks away. He'd take the hoe and chop away the weeds. For that tree was the most important thing in that garden. Nothing took the place of that tree. He gave every bit of attention he had to that tree. Why? It was the thing he wanted to decorate that little open, that little uh, open spot. It was the thing he was concerned about. Every morning he'd look at it. Every evening he'd look at it. He'd take care of being sure it got enough water, enough sunshine, enough warmth, and keep the howling winds away. And here at First Baptist Church, I, listen, several years ago, I had a little talk with the devil. And I said, old, as old Billy's son used to say, I said, old smutty face, you've gotten the last kid from our church you're going to get without a fight. The last one. I sat in my office, and I, I caught the tears of parents who came and, 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 and wept on my shoulder. And I caught the tears of parents whose lives were wrecked and ruined. I sat over here one day at this, at this bus, bus uh, station with a man in this church who had given his life for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was to rear, to send his boy off to college. I've seen that, little, that man go to work out the steel mills night after night. Late at night, work all night long. I've seen that man wear the same suit to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night for years. I've seen him come home and place a little money in the bank, hoping and dreaming that someday he could send that boy off to school and get the privileges he never enjoyed. I've seen that man come to church week after week and his little wife come in the same old dress. Why? They had a dream. That dream was to live to see the day when that boy could go off to the, to the university and become educated and get the things this dear couple could not enjoy. I walked over here, I drove over here one day to the bus station, Greyhound bus station. I sat there as that man said goodbye to that son. I saw him take out his handkerchief and wipe tears from his eyes and quivering lips. He said, Preacher, this is the happiest day of my life. This is the happiest day of my life. I saw that little mother wipe tears from her eyes and hug that boy and say, Son, I'm so proud of you. I heard that man with his stooped shoulders say to that tall, stalwart young man, I'm proud of you, my son. You're getting to go to college, which I never got to do. That man had saved for 18 long years. That man had worked in the, in the undesirable conditions of the steel mills and blast furnaces for 18 years. And I saw him as he said, Preacher, this is the happiest day of my life. Off to college he went. I saw that boy come back. I saw him come back from school in less than a year. Stand up at his mom and dad. Laugh at the Bible they believed. Wouldn't even come back to the church where they attended. All the savings of 18 years and all the tears and all the heartache and all the heartbreak gone down the drain. The boy's faith was shattered in God and God's Word and the Son of God, living in sin, open rebellion against God and against His parents. And I went to that home and caught the tears of, off the cheeks of those two blessed parents, and they said, Brother Hal, we wish we could die. We wish we could die. I saw people come in the door of my study. One little mother came. And she said, I'll never give up on him. Oh, she said, I'll never give up on him. He's all we had. He's all we had. And one day in my study, I got up off my knees after I'd cried a half a day, and I said to the devil, That does it! You're not going to get him without a fight. 
If I have to make half the deacon board mad, if I have to make folks in this church think I'm preaching along one line all the time, okay, but I'm not going to let these kids go to hell unless the devil has a fight in his life. I'm not going to do it. This wicked, godless world, heathen universities, communistic teachers, liquor traffic, narcotics traffic, vulgar-minded vocabularies. I decided to build some walls around our little plant. I decided to make it possible for our young people to grow up as a little tender hothouse plant. Call them hothouse plants if you want to. Wait to see how they turn out. Yeah, they just grew up in the shelter of the church all the time. You talk to God about that. He wrote the 92nd Psalm. They that be planted in the house of God. I get on my knees again and again. And I beg you, mothers and dads, hear what I'm saying this morning. Don't sacrifice your kids on the altar of your unwillingness to hear the Word of God and God's man who's been doing this for 25 long, long years. I know what I'm talking about. I'm simply saying, you're going to, live, you're going to shed tears. I'm not going to be happy when you do. I'm going to cry with you. But I've seen too many shipwrecks. And young people, you mark it down. Last night, I couldn't go to sleep for weeping about some of you kids. I wept on my pillow last night till I finally wept myself to sleep. Why? Because I want more than I want to live. I want to see you amount to something for God. I want to see you strong, stalwart, dedicated, consecrated Christians. Every time I see a weed, I'm going to chop it down. And I'm tired of some of you parents coming up and want me to put that weed back after I chop. Saw a kid on the stairs this morning, and I said to him, I said, you... You're not going to act like you've been acting. You're not going to do it. I'm going to chop the weed down. So this man owned the house, would take the check every day. And then he'd get the best soil. And we're trying to get the best soil for our kids. And he'd cut out the weeds. And he'd, take the, he'd build the house around, keep the winds off, and keep it near the owner all the time. Now listen, this little tree... Follow me carefully. This little tree, here's the house built around it. It's by itself. It's sheltered. The faults of this little tree are going to be seen more and made more visible to us than all the trees of the forest. Now, you take our kids, and you put them in Hammond Baptist High School, you're going to see their faults more than you'd see them if they're out in the world. You know, it sort of irritates me. It's when some parent comes and says, Yeah, I heard somebody said a curse word out of Hammond Baptist High School. It's no better than the public schools. You've got a hole in your head. Of course it's better than the public schools. Well, somebody said, I saw a four-letter word carved on a library table at Hammond Baptist High School. That's no better than the public schools. Yes, it is. Because the kid got kicked out that did it. And we hate it. And you don't have to hear it from the mouths of teachers, to say the least, and we're fighting it all the time. Sure, you're going to see. Look, some of you parents, you say, well, I'll tell you what, my son never got in trouble in a public school, and he's been in trouble in Hammond Baptist. <laughs> I know. If, if he'd have done in Hammond Baptist what he did in the public school and never got caught for, he'd been, ex he'd been killed by now. We'd have put him in the electric chair. I'm simply saying, look, look, look. We used to have a we used to have a, a white gloves inspection when I was in the army. Anybody here ever have a white gloves inspection? A lieutenant. Now I, I love everybody, but there's some that have been awfully hard for me to love. And to me, the last person I learned to love was a second lieutenant. And sometimes I lapse back into carnality about him, about them now. They called them shave tails in the army. The second lieutenant, nobody any worse than the second lieutenant. Amen? Amen. You say, well, I was one. Well, confess your sin. We'll have an invitation after a while. You can come here and kneel at the altar. But uh, anyway, we used to have a white gloves inspection. They'd come by on Saturday morning and say, uh, Inspection! Arm! 
You grab that gun out of your hand and had a white glove. Now, you're supposed to have that, oil, uh, that, gun, that gun oiled and clean, and he had run that white glove down through the, the parts on that gun. He got one little speck of oil on it. Listen, we had to pull KP. Then I got to where they called me KP Hiles. <laughs> Why? White glove inspection. Now, listen, of course you're going to find more things wrong at Hammond Baptist High School. We have white glove inspections all the time. The difference is this. You won't hear a teacher use a bad word in Hammond Baptist. If you do, that teacher will be fired the day I find out about it. And you won't even hear a teacher that will put up with it. And we weed them out. Say, well, Brother Hiles, I just think that cursing, I think cursing is cursing too. And I know we've had some cursing a time or two at Hammond Baptist High School. But I do what we do, brother. We're, we're trying to, weed, to, to chop the weeds out, and we'll chop the weeds out. And you make, you make a note of this, kids, as I've said before. If you curse and I find out about it, you'll be cursing in public school next week. I'm simply saying, ladies and gentlemen, if we'll plant them. Did you know that in, in a child's life, a little child is, when that little cord is cut in the life of a child, dividing it from its mother, there starts a severance. And that severance continues until that child says goodbye at the altar. Nobody ever gets married in this church. But what I don't feel for the parents, old Bob Ben Gorf, I even felt for him. And he came, I, I recall the, the night Becky got married, I preached in this church hundreds and thousands of times. I know every nook and cranny. I helped build this thing. I checked on every piece of wood that's put in this building. But when, that, when Mrs. Colston started playing Here Comes a Bride and I stood up here beside Becky, my knees knocked all over the way down. I want you to know I was a nervous wreck before I got here. <laughs> and when, 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 uh, when uh, I've forgotten who it was stood up here now, I asked, who gives a bride away? I felt like saying, I don't have any idea in this world. But you know, between the time, between the time that that cord is severed between the mother and the child, until the time the child goes off to school or gets married, it's a constant, gradual process of pulling away. Now, you can do one of two things. You can say, when the child gets 14, you just don't appreciate your old father anymore. All I do is slay my hands to the bone. And I'm your old mama. <laughs> old is right. I'm your old mama. And you don't appreciate me anymore. I mean, after all, I wash and I cook and you know, I just, I just not appreciate it. Did you know that every mama that's ever lived in the history of this world, did you know that Eve said the same thing to Abel and to Cain? Did you know every mother that's ever lived has said that? Unless that mother stopped to realize that's a natural process. And if that mother can realize that as a child pulls away from the family, he has a, he has a vacuum in his life. He has some time he's going to spend somewhere outside the family. A beginner child will spend, I think, 10% of time away from his family. A primary child, I think, will spend 25% of time away from his family. A junior child will spend 50% away from his family. A junior high schooler will spend 75% away from his family. A high schooler will spend 90% away from his family. Now, you've got to face it. It is a natural process given by God. Now, there's one of two things. Either the child's going to go to the devil, or the church is going to provide increasing activities for that child as he grows older. That means you have to, church has to have more for a primary than a beginner, and more for a junior than a primary, and more for a junior high than a junior, and more for a high schooler than a, than a junior high schooler. And that's why we do everything we can to be sure that our young people can build their lives around the church and be planted in the house of God. We just got through with the pastor school. And you know something of the burden that I carry for this country. There are two burdens, two things I've given my life to, and anybody that comes to this church knows this is true. 
I've given my life to try to save this nation with preachers. I've also given my life to your children. I won't tell you who this is because it would be embarrassing to this person. But I think I ought to tell you. You'd be surprised what what I do myself to try to help your kids. Last night, I talked to four, five, or six, yesterday, yesterday, several, Friday night, several, little kids. They're not doing too well. One little boy, <laughs> one little boy, <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, it's not, it's not funny, it's sad, but he had taken two long-haired girls sitting in front of him. He had tied their hair together. <laughs> and... Uh, I mean, fella, if you're here, I'm not laughing because I think you ought to do it. I'm laughing because I never thought heard about doing that before. And uh, he had taken the long hair of one girl and tied it to the long hair of the other. They both got up, they started walking away, and they both pulled each other, you know. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> and uh, so he was brought to me, and uh, and I said, "Why? What? I don't know." But, but why? Why? I mean, I love you. And I did. I, I, lo- I love you. And I'm trying to help you. I know. Well, are you going to do it again? No, but now that I've preached about it, 45 others will. Well, look, you're my buddy. I know I'm your buddy. Well, well you're going to have to do better. I'm going to do better. Now, you know why I spend time? Did you know when God called me to preach, He didn't mention talking to a kid who had tied two girls' hair together? You know why I do? I love the little type. He's one of my boys. And I love him. Mother came to me with a little boy the other day. She said, my boy needs to take medicine, but he can't take it. I said, why? She said, he can't swallow a pill. I said, oh, he can too. She said, no, he can't swallow a pill. He said, I have to take the capsule and empty the powder of the capsule into a teaspoon full of water. He just get gags on a pill. I said, oh, he can swallow a pill. She said, no, he can't. I said, bring him in here. I'll teach him how to swallow a pill. So Dr. Hiles had an appointment with a little kid. He came in the office. And I said, now, here's the way you do it. I got a capsule. Stuck it on his tongue. I curled his tongue up like that. He curled it up. I said, now, take this water. I can't. I, didn't. I said, you can. You know, you take it. I got it. <laughs> Poured it on down. It went down. He came in last night. I said, how you doing? He said, I can take it in less than a minute now. It took three. <laughs> I think he said a minute. He was bragging on but probably the best, Probably the best pill taker in this church. I said, like, Lord. Good kid. Nice kid. And this week, his mother wrote me a letter. One of the sweetest letters I ever got. I should have brought it, but I didn't bring it with me. She said, Dear Pastor, I've watched you this week. She said, You're trying to save America. She said, To think that a man would stand up in front of all those preachers and try to save America. And yet he'd take time to teach my boy how to take a pill. You know why? I love America, and I love that boy. That's what it says about the Father in Psalm number 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Where is the glory of God? Above the heavens! The next verse it says, For out of the mouth of babes and sucklings is thou ordained strength because of thy enemies. Kids, let me say again, let's amount to something for God. Let's be clean. Let's be dedicated. Let's thank God for what we have. Let's give our best to Christ. And moms and dads, why don't you trust me? Why don't you trust me? I hate to bring up names, but 
Ask Lynn Navamay if I'll hurt you. Ask him. This morning, Terry Smith stands in the pulpit. He gone back now. He stands in his pulpit in Longview, Texas. Fastest growing church in the state of Texas. How did it happen? Terry built his life around the church. I can recall one night Terry came to Terry, Terry came to me and said, Brother House, could I go soul winning with you? I said, Sure. Little teenager Terry, young teenager and I took off soul winning. Went down here on Kane Street, that where the school is. Walked in one night and one little lady to Christ. She came forward the next Sunday and Terry said, It's the most fun I ever had in my life. He's pastoring this morning. You know why? It was planted in the house of the Lord. Down in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, the second son, Tom, is preaching right now. Tom. You know why Tom's what he is? He's planted in the house of God. Planted. I recall one day Tom came to me and said, Well, the house, could I ever go soul winning with you? I said, Sure, Tom. We took off out in Black Oak, so when Mrs. Hentner, are you here this morning? She probably hey, remember that. Your husband sitting out in the backyard. There's a tree about to die out there in the backyard. What kind? Of, uh, what was a weeping willow tree is about to die. So they called a preacher. Somebody's dying. You called a preacher. Walk back there, and there Mr. Hinton sat. Tom Smith and I, out so in it. And uh, hey, what's it? Hey, Mr. Hinton, I'm Jack Hiles. What, what you doing? Now I got a tree about to die out here. We talked about the tree for a while. Tom was there, and we started talking to Mr. Hinton. In a few minutes, he was saved. Why is Tom Smith pastoring a growing church now? He was planted in the house of God. And then up in New Jersey, Mullica Hill, New Jersey, the third, the, the, the baby boy is preaching this morning. His name is Tim. He plucked one of the loveliest flowers we have in the church here. He calls me father-in-law. His baby calls me grandfather. <laughs> Papa. How could a young, active, virile man like me be Papa? <laughs> He's preaching. You know why? Because he was planted in the house of God. Planted in the house of God. You don't have to be a preacher to turn out good. In fact, you might be a preacher and turn out bad. But I'll bind you one thing. If you'll take that little baby the first day he or she's home in the hospital, take her up and put her in the nursery, be sure and get your tag now and keep it. Or if you lose your tag, you'll never get your baby back. <laughs> put that little baby in the nursery and keep it there. Walk away and say, I hate to leave my baby in a dirty old nursery. Of course, it grows up in a dirty old house, but the dirty old nursery. Is. And uh, you look in the window, that's my baby. Put him there first Sunday's home in the hospital. If Mama's still sick, Dad, you bring him. Put him in the nursery. And you, let, you let those faithful workers up there take care of your baby. And when he gets a year old, ship him down to the toddler's. He's old enough then to break everything in the nursery. <clears throat> Let those folks try to catch him and teach him something. When Trina was home, she's a little over a year now. She's been, she's, she's sort of being a bad girl, and I said, shh. She went, shh. You, you just try to catch him. Then when the child becomes four, or three to two, you get you let Mrs. Newton and then Mrs. Barr have him for a while, and let those faithful ladies teach him about Christ. And when he gets four, you tur you take him to Mrs. Rice. God bless that dear lady. You take him to Mrs. Rice, and let her, even though she has a terrible draw, you let her have him for a while. And then after he gets. Out of Mrs. Rice's department, you see if you can take him over to Mrs. McKinney. And you let her teach him for a while. Then you send him to 
Hammond Baptist Grade School or Baptist City Grade School. And let the teachers have him every day in school till he gets his diploma. Then you ship him up to the primary to Mrs. Burnside and Mrs. Simpson. And then when he becomes a junior, you let Mrs. Schof have him. And after he leaves there, you give him for a while <clears throat> Mrs. Plopper. And then Mrs. Plopper will give him to Mrs. Wachter, and then he'll be a junior high kid. That's about as big as you'll ever get. And then you let Mrs. Roskowski, terrible name, but a wonderful lady. Her name was Smith before she married. What a tragedy. From Smith to Roskowski, there'll be a book written on that. But you let Mrs. Roskowski have him for a while. And then the next one is Smith. Let Mrs. Smith have him for a while. And then you ship him on to Mrs. Tobin and on to Mrs. Colston. And you let him come to all the youth activities and sing in the choir. Sing about the, the uh, ecumenical movement. And then you come to this auditorium. And we'll cry together. And you'll be proud. And I'll give Mr. Plomo from high school and shake his hand. And we'll go home and say, Blessed be God, they that be planted in the house of the Lord shall bring forth fruit in their old age. And then you enroll him in Howells Anderson College or some other Christian college. Let him, let him train to the best he can be for God. I know no greater joy than investing my life in the lives of your kids. They're mine too. And I love them. Let us plant them in the house of God. This boy has a right to, 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 to grow up and amount to something for God. Let's see to it he does. Let us pray. Thank you for listening. If you want to know more about Jesus and what the gospel means to you, then hit the video shown on the left of the screen and please don't forget to subscribe. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless your day. Hello, we are Mark and Pearl Lambert, and we are the ministers of Jesus Answers Prayers. If you like this ministry, please help support it. The link to donate is found in the description below. Thank you and God bless.